Okay, welcome everyone to a session called Reframing Climate Change. I'm Mark Galloway, I'm the director of IBT, the International Broadcasting Trust. Apparently, according to my Twitter feed, John Snow said earlier this morning that uh, climate change is the most important issue facing us and that TV has ghettoized it. Was anyone at the John Snow session? What did, what did he say? Can we have a mic, please? This lady here, the second row. Um, yeah, he was there to speak about his, his work trialing um, skunk on screen um, because it was a science presentation. But he said, you know what, I do think climate change is the prime issue that should underpin all the questions we ask about the world around ourselves. And um, I was quite taken aback to hear that and very pleased to hear that, actually. Thank you. Something well, that's much. really what we're talking about today. Climate change is a huge issue. Uh, it, uh, and there is a lot of media coverage. Um, it, there was an item on the Today programme this morning. There's a lot of coverage in the news. But outside the news and current affairs, I think it's fair to say that television has struggled to find the right form. Uh, about 18 months ago, IBT produced a report called The Environment on TV. And there's some copies here if anyone wants a copy. And <laughs> uh, we wanted to test this hypothesis uh, and look closely at what television has done. And the authors of the report found that there was what they called a creative gap, that there was a lot of coverage of environmental issues, but climate change itself, um, TV commissioners were on the back foot and they were asking producers to come up with more imagin imaginative ways of reaching an audience. Um, and that's what we'll be exploring today uh, with, all, with all of you. The aim of this session is to find out how can we come up with some ideas that work for our commissioners uh, and engage the audience. So this is going to be a little bit more interactive than some of the sessions I've been to, which consist of about 60 minutes or 75 minutes from the front and then a few questions squeeze into the end. So we're going to start with the audience. Uh, if you can just say hello to the person sitting next to you, tell them who you are, why you're here, what you hope to get out of this session. Uh, do you agree with Jon Snow? Does TV hello. ghettoize hello. climate hello. change? I'm here because I'm like hello. basically hello. straight to the lions. Basically, we don't do enough to get on Channel 4. And can we have the hello. roving mics hello. ready? Hello. 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 Yeah, well, very, same with me. <laughs> but, uh, no, but I do, well, I'll say, but I do, I'm a climate scientist by background. Um, but I do really, I, I, the big thing, I, I'm not really sort of so much into moaning as to whether or not television is done in, you know, good by climate change. More, I really sense that... Okay, well, my feeling is that I could just leave you talking for a long time, but... Yeah. And can we can we have some roving mics? Can you tell us story. what you've been that's, saying? That's where I'm coming from. Can we stop talking for a moment, please? <laughs> Having been invited to talk, you must now stop talking. Yeah. Does anyone want to volunteer? Why they're here? What they hope to get out of the session? Do you agree with John Snow that TV ghettoizes the subject of climate change? Hands up. Who wants to report back? You were probably Just there. say who you are. I'm Russell Beard. I'm a, an ecologist and a, a reporter on an environmental show for Al Jazeera called Earthrise. Um, we were at a, a session the other, uh, just yesterday uh, with some commissioners, ITV, uh, Channel 4, Sky, BBC, and um, uh, they all showed some clips of upcoming series that, that they were really excited to be part of. And um, at the end of the session, at the very end, one of the question, questions from the audience was about the big issues. They said, this is all a little bit kind of Little Britain. What are you doing to, to cover some of the biggest issues? And he didn't say specifically climate change. He said, said like, overpopulation, a few other things, you know. And, um, and they all kind of looked at each other. And it was a bit like, oh. And there was one lady from Sky said that, yeah, they, they, 
they really cared about um, climate change because they had some recycling uh, buckets in the office. Um, and then just kind of laughed it off. And then the whole audience <laughs> laughed. And so I, I guess I just... To, just to say I agree, I think that's what it was. It's a shame. So I think it's okay, really valuable what you're doing. More comments. Incidentally, Russell is one of the filmmakers who was shortlisted for the pitch. If you're interested in hearing some ideas from filmmakers, come at 4.30 in the chapel, and you'll see five filmmakers pitching. Yeah. Uh, David Wilkham, Peace Child Film and Television Workshop. I asked that question, and I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was as flummoxed. I also asked the question of Charlotte Moore just now, and she didn't have an answer either. I don't think they ghettoize it. I just don't think they get it. I, the, you know, Naomi Klein wrote probably the best book ever on climate change in the last year, and I haven't seen anything like that seriousness of detail or examination of the crap way the UN is uh, dealing. And we've got The Guardian leading the way with the Keep It in the Ground campaign, and television media just hasn't caught up. It's not there at all. Okay, well, let's hope by the end of this session you've changed your mind, because we've certainly got two commissioners who do care about this issue and want to commission programming. But let's, let's not start with a TV person, let's start with a non-TV person. Actually, I'll just introduce the panel so that you know who they are. At the far end, David Glover, Head of Special, Specialist Factual at Channel 4. Next to David, Emily Schuckberg from the British Antarctic Survey. Joe Smith from the University, Open University, and Cassian Harrison, uh, who commissions for BBC Four. He's the channel editor on BBC Four. Uh, let, let's actually hear from a climate scientist. Emily, do you want to kick us off? How well do you think TV covers this issue? Yeah, so I was going to start off with um, actually talking a little bit about the big picture of the world outside the media and how I see this issue developing in, in that outside world because well, my sense is that that's what me, the media needs to respond to. And I have really seen um, a, a sea change over the last you know, 12, 18 months or so um, where actually in the outside world, climate change is being reframed. There is a new narrative around climate change. It's moved on from the ghettoized pollution box um, and now um, it's, much, it's not, no longer really about is it or isn't it. Um, it's about um, recognising the risks, but then, importantly, looking at the solutions, looking at the responses. And that opens up a whole new, exciting world of creative thought and innovation and, and so forth, and seizing the opportunities. And very much the, the, the business community, um, many aspects of it are, are looking at through that very, very different lens. And all of that was underlined yesterday with the G7, who might not have made a particularly bold statement from a climate perspective, but in terms of a new narrative, a new direction in which the world is moving, um, then that was really setting the scene. Um, in terms of the science, I mean, just to sort of, you know, emphasize some of that, um, in terms of the sort of recognizing the risks aspect of it, um, it, the, his, this is a picture from Antarctica. I work for the British Antarctic Survey, and we really are seeing you know, Antarctica on the move at the moment in terms of climate change. Um, there's a couple of ice sheets we're particularly concerned about, Larsen C, which is twice the size of Wales. Um, a and B, Larsen's have already collapsed, and huge areas collapsing in a matter of weeks. So, you know, really rapid changes um, happening in. Antarctica that have potentially huge global impacts. Um, the whole of West Antarctica, uh, West Antarctic ice sheet um, is grounded below sea level and if that collapsed then potentially we get four metres of sea level rise over some unknown period of, of time. And it's not, the other thing that we're really recognising in terms of the risk side of things from a science perspective is that this isn't all about distant threats either, you know, happening elsewhere in the world or in the distant future. It's also about um, you know, changes that are happening now. So if we think back to um, 2003, when we had a massive heat wave in Europe that caused many, many different, uh, many, many deaths, uh, premature deaths, particularly of elderly people. Um, now it's nice to think that we'd like, to, we'd all like to have a bit of a heat wave, um, but that was a really serious issue. 
And the odds of having that kind of thing of, we're now realising are really dramatically changing. So the sort of background risk is about one in a thousand. By the time that we had this heat wave in 2003, it was one in 50. And then just 10 years later, now today, it's one in five. So that's, you know, big changes happening now that affect us and our daily lives. Um, and we obviously had lots of flooding examples in the UK in recent years again, affecting people in their households. So this is a story in terms of the risks that is affecting you know, television viewers throughout the country, mm -hmm. here and now, not future generations off in the distance, which is, I think, what the sort of traditional story picture around climate change has been very much about. So the science is kind of recognising that the risks are a bit different, perhaps, to the ones that we've um, traditionally thought about in a climate change context. But then I think the most important part of the story, um, where I've seen the biggest changes, um, is in terms of the responses. So this is a, um, a new um, retrofit of a Marks and Spencer store that was opened the other week up in, um, uh, up in Newcastle um, that's got all sorts of green and eco-climate change related resilience and uh, mitigation um, aspects associated with it. But, and that's just one part of the business community who are really seeing this not as just responding to a corporate social responsibility agenda, but seeing this from an opportunities perspective and making it not just a silo part of their business, but integral to their whole business strategy. And that, I see, as being very reflective of just a change narrative more generally that you know, our future, again, as underlined by the G7 statement yesterday, is going to be a different future. And um, I see that there's a real opportunity for the media to respond to that um, and to help tell that story of what our future is going to be, how that's relevant to people's lives. And you, you, from what you're saying, you're implying the media's behind the story has I to think catch up. My, my sense is, and even just from the comments that we've had mm. just now, that, you know, this, that, that the media is still with the old story of it being a ghettoised pollution mm. standalone box and hasn't really caught up with the broader picture, which is very much about this being part of the mainstream future of everyone, um, and that there are going to be choices um, that we've got to respond to. And there are going to be opportunities that we can seize or not um, in terms of the responses. Um, and uh, do you... And that is, it, you know, it's not... It kind of changes the whole framing from being a sort of negative, doom and gloom story mm. to actually being a story of exciting opportunities. Exciting opportunities in terms of the technology, exciting opportunities in terms of, you know, the different kind of world that we'll be living in. It's much more of a... You know, a positive and engaging story than the kind of doom and gloom pollution thing. Mm. But but it's and, and, and yeah, as I say, I see that happening in every other sphere other than the media. Mm. Okay, thank you. Let, let's go to Cassian next. You're actually one of the commissioners who has commissioned films about climate change. I have. Can you talk us through your your journey, not uh, how you got to commission them, why you specifically commissioned what you commissioned? And uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that I think that everybody in this room is all, um, we'll, we'll, none of us would disagree with the idea that it is an important subject uh, and that, 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 that it's something that we should be collectively as a society and indeed as a planet talking about. I think that the interesting thing and the challenge, but it's a really exciting challenge and an opportunity is this question about how do you find, how do you frame uh, the questions around climate change in interesting ways that feel novel and fresh to the audience. Um, I did, for BBC4, I commissioned one particular piece which went out earlier this year, which was Climate Change by Numbers. Um, and that was motivated by a, a, a combination of two things. One, a kind of particular passion of mine, and also one which very much aligned with what BBC4 is and what its profile is. I think one of the great things about BBC4 is it's a channel which can be unashamedly intelligent and unashamedly brainy even. And, and that the audience really like that, uh, and that the brainier it gets, actually, the more they like it. And the question for me was, that it, was, it, was it, it was as much kind of personal one as anything, which was that um, it struck me that it was about the science behind climate change. 
Um, and obviously what there have been is endless kind of debates and conversations about, well, how do we know that it's really happening? The kind of standard climate change deniers kind of question. Um, but the question to me was actually, well, how do we know that it's really happening? How do we understand what's happening to an entire planet and its atmosphere and how it's behaving? How do we know that the, how, how can we predict what the temperature is going to do over the um, course of the next century? Um, and so that was a kind of challenge that I then set uh, the science department of the BBC to have a look at this and to unpack it. Um, and, and, and what came out of that actually was a really fascinating and I think remains an extraordinary story which isn't really talked about, casts the debate in a different light but still I think a really interesting one which is ultimately the science of climate change is the biggest, biggest scientific problem that the human race is currently facing. It's, a, it's an environmental change, but actually it's a really interesting scientific problem. Um, how do you predict and model an entire atmosphere? And the truth of it is, is that, um, that actually the reason why we have doubts and uncertainty about it is because we haven't built enough computers to deal with it. I mean, literally, climate change and, and atmospheric modelling is using more computers on this planet than any other task that there is. Um, but we haven't got enough of them. So I think something like 54 supercomputers currently working, currently trying to model the planet's atmosphere. Really interesting, just actually as a, as a, as a big scientific question for the human race. Um, so that was what kind of motivated me. Um, I've actually got the kind of pre-title of the film that we did. I won't talk much more, but I'll just play that, and that will give you a sense of the frame of how the film works. So let's play that. So that's, that's the basic frame of it, and it becomes an absolutely fantastic. Three different people, three different voices, none of whom were kind of ardent pro-climate changes or whatever. They were mathematicians. Um, but what you find through it is it also unpacks an extraordinary story, kind of mathematical endeavour, because it includes everything from kind of the Monte Carlo method, which was originally developed for devising nuclear bombs, uh, to methods of statistical interpretation that were first invented in order to, uh, uh, to, to, to help a guy sell off gold lots in South Africa. Um, to various others. So it becomes a really engaging story that is both about how we know what we know, these numbers that we see on the front page of newspapers all the time, and how those are actually rooted in a scientific journey which goes back hundreds, hundreds of years, basically. So I thought it was really intriguing and it came out really well. So ha having done that, what, do you have anything in the pipeline? Uh, I don't have particularly at the moment. I, I have to say, I'm slightly embarrassed, there's a chap called Russell Barnes here who I've been talking about who actually has a very good idea for a climate change film, which I just don't think I can do because I don't have oh, okay. the funding. Russell, who uh, are you? <laughs> Russell, put can your we, hand up. Can we... Tell us about Only Green in the Village because it's a really lovely idea. Yeah, <laughs> can we have the mic here, please? <laughs> If it's, everyone could just wait really, it's, for the mic because really this session is being been recorded. Russell about for a while. I just don't know if I can find a home. But Russell, it's about a year, on. I think, on and off. Um, uh, a year of tasters and um, proposals. No, no. But I mean, it's been a pleasure talking about it for all that time. Um, I think. <laughs> 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 He's certainly charming. <laughs> if anybody else wants to give a shit, it's um, um, Robert Llewellyn um, wants to turn his village green, and, and he's really doing it. Uh, Robert Llewellyn from Scrappy Challenge and Red Dwarf. Um, and it's a kind of how-to manual to do that in your village. And it says, we call it the archers meets the inconvenient truth. Uh, that's the billing. Um, uh, but yeah, no, I, I think what's really interesting is that I, even that film, there's a sense in which you can't really do climate change on telly, if we're, if we're honest. Behind the scenes, green, worthy, these are things that you can't attach to, you know, you're worried about selling upwards to your channel controllers. And I think it's, 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 it's hard, I'd be very interested to know from the commissioning editors how hard it is really to kind of pitch these things internally. Um, there's a sense in which you have to counter think. Uh, it's, it's seen as too Guardian reader. And, uh, you know, the BBC and Channel 4 mustn't touch Guardian type subjects. And I think, you know, what we find as, as when we're pitching ideas, is that we're up against a kind of wall uh, of resistance right at that level. That, you know, you try and touch a climate change subject and unless you dress it up in, in, in maths, it's a maths show with a bit of climate change in it, or you, know, you just, it's very, very hard to make headway. Um, so we've tried to dress things up with this um, Archer's Village approach, but uh, okay. C can I'm I... interested to kind of know what, what people think about it. Okay. Uh... I'm, I'm not sure it is true that there's a wall of resistance. It's interesting that that's your sense, because with IBT we've been having a, a number of conversations with commissioners, and I think this is why we call this session Reframing Climate Change. I think there's a... 
<laughs> I mean, I'd be interested to, to find out from other companies right, what their experience is, because I, I, I think you would find that. Let's come point. back to the wall of resistance well, once we've heard from David. Yeah, I think respond. the fair thing with Russell's piece, which I think is interesting, because it does actually address the issue of ghettoisation, <laughs> which is what, 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 what Russell has been working on, is something which is tremendously engaging, because it does sit, sit outside of a ghetto. It feels interestingly, and I think this is true of all commissioning, certainly within the BBC we feel this very strongly, which is that the most engaging ideas tend to come not from particular genres or from the heart of them, but where we find the interface between one genre and another, where we mix them up. And I think those kind of dialectics and where kind of, you know, factual entertainment meets science or where history meets documentary or whichever, that can be the place where the most stimulating thoughts come. And actually, you know, in the end, it is, it's more, it's more a comment on the BBC and BBC 4's finance state than it is actually on Russell's idea, because actually it's a really brilliant piece of cross-genre working, which is that what he's turned uh, is he's turned environmental issues into a soap opera. Uh, and it's rather fabulous. And I think, you know, it has a lot of merit in its idea. I find the money, I'll do it. That's what I say. So okay. that's my only well, point. Well, let, let's mm -hmm. come back to that and we'll get audience feedback a bit later. Let's just hear from David, because it strikes me that um, when Catherine talks about mixing genres, that that's actually your forte. Yeah, well... Um it's nice of you to say. Uh, you also kindly introduced me as someone that cares about climate change. Um, there's scant little evidence of that, frankly, in my output. Um, but I do. Um, I think that, speaking to Russell's point, that there is a kind of, it is hard. Uh, I think that, you know, the traditional way it's seen is that it's a complicated, bad news story that people already know. Even if you do know about it, it's, you know, there's nothing much I can do about it, and it doesn't sound that bad anyway. And it's kind of, you know, there's sort of there's a whole lot of negativity around it as a subject matter. And I suppose the Channel Four project is trying to find things which matter, which millions of people want to watch. And that kind of balance in the paradox of Channel Four is that we're commercial and we're public service at the same time. And climate change, making that commercial, is really hard. Um, but is it interesting or not? How do we reframe it? I was talking to my dad, who's a philosopher, and I was saying, what do you think about climate change? And he goes, um, he'd read some science report which outlined the different possible scenarios. And one of the scenarios is that basically the reaches a runaway climate change, and basically most of the planet, possibly all the planet, becomes uninhabitable for the human race. And he was saying, that's, the, that's, that's potentially, that's one of the scenarios that we're facing. And he was saying, uh, you know, is the human race a species which is capable of putting aside our own individual rational self-interest to solve this problem. And if we are capable of doing that, he was saying, what an unbelievable precedent that would be. What an extraordinary precedent it would be if we could get together as a human race and solve this in some way. That would be an amazing thing going forward for the human race. But are we, are we capable of that? And that's a live question right now. Um, and it's, it seems to me that is an interesting question. And, uh, you know, I just think, I think that basically the way we think of this thing is wrong. And I think that it's a very, very big deal and very interesting. Um, and I think we probably need to tackle it head on. That's what I think. And it's true that you have some projects at Channel 4 in the pipeline? A few, not very many. I mean, we had to kind of scrabble around looking for some clips for you. Um, basically, uh, there's, uh, I, mean, I, I mean, there's a few things where I could point to, but I don't really want to be like a politician saying, you know, I've done so well, because the truth is, we haven't. Um, so, but I mean, there's some clips uh, we could show you, we're not going to, but we could, uh, live from space, we had a very interesting scene with an astronaut talking about looking down on the Earth and realizing how precious it was. And the astronaut perspective on the Earth was very interesting in terms of things like the Aral Sea, which has basically pretty much dried up in the last 20 years, and also just images of kind of the cities just mushrooming. And that kind of the astronaut's perspective on it was interesting. Um, what else was there? In a lot of, we do kind of weather porn sorts of programming, which is kind of, you know, footage of natural disasters. And sometimes we sneak in a bit of climate change stuff in there. And we've got a rather interesting film about polar bears uh, coming through, which is one of my teams, Sarah Ramsden's. But I mean, I kind of feel very bogus kind of saying like, you know, we do a lot because the truth is we don't and we should do more. And it's just a shame because it is fascinating. So what exactly is stopping you doing more? Just the perception or are the ideas not coming through? Yeah, I think a bit of everything. I think that sort of, uh, I don't think I've found the idea where I've thought, 
this is the this is the way to do it and i kind of don't want to do it just in a sort of um like a kind of um you know supporting an industry that isn't working sort of way like subsidies i don't think that's the way to do tv and i'm basically so I, even though i'd love to do something on it i want to find some way which basically changes the game and really really does it and um and so you're looking for a big idea well yeah we always say that though. it's very helpful so I know, <laughs> changing the game are you are there other examples you can reference? Is it something like Trevor Felix talking about race? Oh, I'm thinking kind of a bigger than that. Bigger I mean, I suppose I, I, well, I, just in terms of what's possible. Um, I went to school with a guy called um, Jamie Drummond, and he was he remember he, when we were going to school at the time of uh, Live Aid and Band Aid, and he noticed that basically after Live Aid and Band Aid, Mrs. Thatcher cut the um, the overseas aid spend by more than was raised by those initiatives. And then he looked into it further and he realized all these third world countries we're giving aid to have massive debt to pay off. So he set up a little thing above a, a shop called Jubilee 2000. Actually, there's a guy here at the Sheffield Dock Festival called Mike Christie. He came up with the slogan, Drop the Debt. And they started a campaign. And that campaign has actually led to the eradication of most of the world's third world debt. And uh, the latest estimates suggest in that time, they've saved 25 million lives and put 20 million kids in school. And I watched that happen because he's a guy I know. And I think that the, we have that, if we could find the right way of doing this, there's possible, we could make massive change and massive change is required. So kind of, um, I suppose that's, that's, for me, it is a very exciting game, but I haven't, I haven't found anything like an answer, but I'd like to. Well, it's interesting that part of Channel 4's remit is to um, produce change in people's lives. Yeah. Uh, so you have things like fish fight, you have events, you have campaigns. Are you thinking that may, climate change could be a territory for something like that? Well, I suppose I think that campaigns are tricky in terms of there's this like campaign fatigue people have about the. I mean, in a way, Jamie's school dinners was a brilliant example of a Channel 4 programme. And then I feel it's sort of slightly been photocopied and photocopied and photocopied as a way of making TV to the point where the ink's kind of run out on the photocopier a bit. And it's sort of, you know what I mean? It's a celebrity and it's a cause and it's a reality TV show. And it's sort of, I think, I don't think, I mean, that's, I mean some of those programs you're mentioning are great. Hughes Fish Fight, great. But that's not the way I'd go. I just think that this, it's, too, it's too by the numbers, that. Okay. Um, so, Joe, uh, you have... Uh, you're an academic, so you view television from a distance, but you also work with the BBC on a number of programmes on these sorts of issues. So what, what, what's your take in, in terms of the record of television? Thanks, yes. Uh, well, I mean, the first thought is what really David's looking for is a sort of archers meets inconvenient truth. <laughs> if only there were... Anyway, we'll leave that thought hanging. Um, yes, thank you. Um, I want to cheer us all up, first off with uh, the thought that actually this is a glass that is resolutely half full in terms of public understanding of this issue. I think the chances of most people on the planet having an awareness of climate change, of most of those people having an awareness that humans are responsible, and most of them being concerned or very concerned, and that these, this polling data is now cross-planetary, um, is, uh, I think, astoundingly good news and actually really improbable when you think of the characteristics of climate change as really difficult new knowledge. Some of the reasons for it being difficult have already been covered. I won't go through them again. So we should just pause and think about that, uh, but also acknowledge that we've not been here before. This is a difficult story to tell. I do think, however, we should shake this assumption that climate change is... Uh, dull and can't rate. Um, uh, I would reference uh, three of my favourite programmes that do a good job of the topic, uh, Blue Peter, uh, The Archers and uh, Grand Designs when it, when it attends with focus to this. Um, so let's just point out that those are among the most popular programmes in their strands across uh, decades now. Um, that must teach us something. It's also something about the gut instincts the makers of those shows have for their audiences that they can judge tone perfectly. And so an anaerobic digester storyline is manageable for listeners to The Archers in a way that we might not have anticipated if we offered it up ourselves. 
Why do we need to reframe the topic? I think some of these points have been touched on, but if we summarise the, the mainstream frame of climate change across the last 20 years as, if you like, the Gore narrative, um, it had a number of characteristics. Um, uh, essentially, the end of the world is nigh all over again. Uh, there was a sort of deliciousness in the catastrophism of, of, of that narrative. Um, also that climate change was somehow a finished and hard fact, and I think Emily's nicely displayed how actually, you know, climate change is compelling, unfolding science. It is, as David pointed out, I think, one of the most ambitious questions that humanity has set itself. Of course it's not finished, it's never going to be finished. But also uh, the notion that this is a fragile earth that we live on, actually there's nothing that's fragile about the planet. Um, our inhabitation is fairly fragile, but that's a really different point. Also controversially, I would suggest that uh, demonization of opposition to action on climate change um, is an own goal and I think disrespectful to sort of 20 to 40 percent of the people you might bump into on any bus queue in any pub. Uh, and I want to talk a bit more about that in a second. But also I question in, in Inconvenient Truth and a lot of the environmentalist narratives around that, the idea that we require a massive mobilisation of people and dollars in the future. As if there's a great big stride from where we are, difficult, bad place, to where we will be, sunlit uplands of plenty of cash being spent and a global military style effort. Um, that fails to recognise, for example, that for Land Rover Jaguar, Climate change has been the biggest driver of innovation across the last 15 years other than the internet in their work. That's true of dozens of FTSE 100 companies. We could come back to that if there's a chance. Okay, so I've said there's lots wrong with that. What should we do instead? Well, certainly a wider range of tones. I would invite our commissioning colleagues to invest, to experiment, to take risks, to take up the creative challenge that the IBT report sets. Roll the dice, try some programs that might or might not work. Um, but certainly, uh, in that context, um, you know, let's all be forgiving of this idea that this is difficult new knowledge that we're going to have to struggle with. Uh, a couple of thoughts um, on changes we need to bring about. I think uh, fear narratives are dangerous magic. And one of the things that I think sociologists now understand well is that the scriptlessness that climate change can leave us with, um, rather like the scriptlessness that nuclear war narratives left people with, um, uh, need to be thought into with care. And uh, I uh, do think that having, putting your head in the sand is actually a really sensible human response to uh, some of those approaches. So let's respect that. So I'm going to just reference a couple of, am I okay for another minute, Mark, or so? Yeah. Stop me if you need to. Um, I just want to reference a couple of programs or films I've seen in the last few days that I think have a tone or an approach that we might reference. So Nelly ben Hayoun's Disaster Playground. Um, uh, witty, sharp, funny, um, uh, in a way that uh, Hollywood's attempt at exploring the impacts of uh, deep space impacts uh, struggled with. Um, and uh, I commend it to all of you. Um, similarly, with responsibility and blame, uh, the question of complicity, of the sense that um, uh, if we only identify uh, the guilty oil shills um, and you know, pin a guilty badge on them, uh, all uh, will be well, <coughs> I think fails to recognise that if we do follow the money, then the, the money will you know, the, the trail will arrive at our door, our pension systems, the jobs of friends and relatives, and so on. So I think we need to think about tone and approach around uh, complicity with care. So my reference point for this would be James Van Der Poel's uh, Britain's Forgotten Slave Owners, which found that, you know, vicars, uh, widowers, and so on, might own one or two slaves in Britain uh, at the time of its abolition. Um, really well-judged tone. Uh, a couple of last points. Um, first, I think we're thinking too small when we talk about climate change. Even Al Gore is thinking too small. What do I mean by that? Um, actually, climate change is really finishing Darwin's sentence. It confirms humanity's real place in the world. It places us 
as part of the natural world and with perhaps a surprising degree of influence over it, a degree that we didn't really anticipate. I think that's a huge story and it's one that'll take time to make sense of, but we're fantastically ingenious. My morning walk took me past the Sheffield Museum, which has a show on about the Ice Age. Uh, we always talk about the future. Let's uh, just doff our cap to those uh, brilliant ancestors of ours that, whose ingenuity got us through the last Ice Age. Um, but we're also thinking too big. So my last reference uh, is going to be to uh, a very charming and entertaining film that's really about who we are, what we love and where we live. Because I think actually that close textured stuff about how our lives might be different if, for example, we didn't have to invest an hour and a half in unpaid labour in traffic queues in the morning. Um, uh, you know, that, that revision of how everyday life feels and how we might have other ambitions for it, is reflected in the magnificent short film Relish, which is about Henderson's Relish, uh, which is, of course, Sheffield's uh, national uh, pride. Um, so Aaron Rodgers and Ian Reddington's piece um, is about who and what we love, who and what we care for. And I think some attention to that would repay us in our uh, grappling for appropriate tones and experiments around media work with climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Let's have some comments, questions from the audience. Just say who you are, if you could wait for the mic. This session's being recorded and will be online at some point. Hello, uh, Philip Purvis. Um, very comforting talk the last, by the last speaker. However, I was wondering if there was a place for a fear narrative. And um, I was thinking, I was looking at design changes soon after the Second World War, during the Cold War, and the acceleration of invention and design during that period, due to fear. Um, if um, There's probably a positive way of framing that somehow. Okay, we'll have a couple more. Yeah, yeah. Yes, hello, Christian Vassi. Um, I've enjoyed a lot of the points that have been made. I think that the broadcasters view everything, from my experience, as too big, too depressing, too impossible to engage with. And I think there's far too little engaging with solutions and communicating with the wider audience mechanisms whereby they can contribute to addressing the challenge that 80% of people accept exists. And I think more innovation uh, in addressing solutions-based programming that was uplifting would be hugely constructive and helpful. Okay, there's a question over here and here. Yep. Hi, Zoe Heron from the um, in-house science department to the BBC. One of the things that I'd like to... Um, you said earlier that uh, climate change programmes don't bring an audience, and as Cassian knows, the last two shows that he's put out, which have been... Um, uncompromisingly um, in depth, have done exceptionally well for his channel, overperforming the slot, the slot average. And interestingly, the 16 to 34 audience comes to them in droves. So I'd really like to question that idea that the audience won't come to climate change. Okay, and there's a question here. And then in the front row, can we have the other mic at the front? Yeah. Hi, my name's Sylvia Rowley. Um, so along with my colleagues, um, Russell and Hugh and some others who are sat here, we've worked on a, a solutions-based environmental show for the last four years. Um, it's on Al Jazeera English and it's called Earthrise. Um, and if you're interested in, in that side of things, I'd, I'd urge you to, um, to watch it, to check it out. Um, but so I think, I think this idea of reframing and, and looking at solutions, I think, it's, I think it's important, but I think it's important for the solutions to match up to the problem and for the problem to be recognised. So if you're talking about um, rising sea levels and melting ice and then, and then showing you know, a picture of an m and retrofit, I understand why that's happened, but, but that kind of thing, um, it really it doesn't, it doesn't match up in people's minds. And I think that, I think that we need, to, be, we need to, to have hopeful narratives, but we also need to to have that jeopardy in the story and that reality check. Because without that, I think 
we can risk kind of sort of turning the juggernaut away from the fear narratives and, and almost encouraging kind of complacency. And actually that's not as interesting a story. The interesting story is the hope and the fear and the anger kind of all together. Isn't that what makes a great story? Okay, yeah. Anyone else? Hello, I'm, I'm Sean Ferguson from the Safety Family Charitable Trust. And um, we're part of an unfurling drama at the moment on diverse invest. So this is about um, turning off the investment in fossil fuels and turning on investment into renewable energy and climate solutions. And a worldwide campaign with trusts, charitable trust foundations, pension funds, universities, you name it, which has got the oil companies and the coal companies on the back foot and panicking. How can that, and we don't want them to feel cornered because we want them to be part of the solution too. So how could that be framed, Joe, by the media so they're not villains because like you say, they're all individuals in that company and we all want um, good pensions for the future, etc. So that, how can that be framed? Because there is jeopardy in this and there is drama and it's, it's, um, it's, it's a building movement. Okay, let, let's take that divestment point first. Joe, uh, is, that, is this a subject that should be being covered by television? Divest Invest. Divest Invest, sorry. Uh, I want to connect this to the question about design acceleration and fear narratives. Um, capital, uh, cap, you know, capital and capitalism, um, its unique genius is to uh, respond to information at, at, at pace and scale. And uh, I'm, I'm baffled by the fact that um, the environment movement, the policy community, and critical journalism has failed to note that essentially one thing we haven't done across the last 20 years is put a meaningful price on carbon. The moment we do that, then we get the kind of pace in technological development that you saw uh, in the context of the war and the Cold War. Um, I think there are more positive accounts of how that works. But uh, essentially, carbon tax, carbon pricing, one way or another, unless we do that, then you have to keep pleading to keep it in the ground. Once you do that, they're just going to keep it in the ground because there are going to be smarter ways of doing it. But I do think hard journalism should follow the Guardian's example as journalism, not campaigning. It's where the qualification lies. Um, to really interrogate whether... Um, actually, in Shell's case, they are looking after shareholder value over the longer term. Unilever is a really interesting comparison, where they've essentially told their shareholders to go away and wait while they work out how to become a sustainable company. Um, let's take the point about solutions and more more positive coverage, Cassian. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I think to, to, to talking into that one, though, stepping back a moment, and, and this isn't ducking the question because it's, it's actually very salient with the BBC, I think we have to think about and acknowledge and examine what it is that television is good at. Um, because television is good at very particular things. It's not good at everything. Um, there are, uh, a, 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 you know, even as an organisation, the BBC is very uh, cognisant of that fact. That's why we do a lot of television, but we also do a lot of radio, and we also do a lot of news, and we do a lot of online news, and we do a lot of interactive support as well. And so due to this solutions point, I mean, one of the things that I've spent quite a lot of time looking at is what are the things, the different elements of what all media do, and there are very um, uh, particular specialisms. So, Actually, in a way, what we find when we look at things is that how to do things, how to solve things, what, you know, what, what can I do about something, is actually something that audiences engage with far more in the interactive space than they do on television. Actually, we do quite a lot of online resources around climate change and also things that you can do and also practices on that point of view. And I'm not, as I say, this isn't a question ducking thing. It's more a thing which I would urge everybody in the room to think about is actually, this is a really pressing question. Television isn't the only solution to answering some of the big questions we have there. Okay, David. I think that the solutions thing is probably too soft for what I'm into and what I'm interested in. I don't think that, I think it's perfectly fine. I, wouldn't, I don't want to criticise it, really. I think if you put some nice stuff in grand designs, that's good. It's a good thing to do. But it, to me, it's not interesting enough. Um, I, don't think it, I also have a slight fear 
that it could become like a background noise of sort of like, like a war on terror, the sort of sense that that was just always on the news, the sort of sense it just kind of seeps into the background of other programs sort of smuggled in. And I, don't, I think this sort of like, hey, it's not bad news, climate change. It's also loads of positive things going on about new technologies. I'm sure that's true, but it's not interesting enough for me to want to make a program or a series about that. Not in that form. But, I mean, I'd like someone to open my mind to that and show me how we could. But I don't, if I'm honest, I, to me it's a bit soft. Emily, you talked about business and business searching for solutions, and Joe mentioned innovation in business. Yeah, so, so I put up the Marks and Spencer's retrofit, not so much as an example of how this was going to hold back the Antarctic ice sheet, um, but more as an example of um, how, and, and Joe's given other examples with Jaguar and Land Rover, how my experience is that many sectors of the business community aren't siloing this activity any longer, but instead putting climate change and sustainability issues at their heart in the mainstream of their business strategies. Um, and that when, I mean, in terms of, you know, how's that going to address the, the global climate problem, then, you know, when you do that, when it is no longer a siloed issue but mainstream, then you start to get the scale at which you can address those kind of issues. Um, so that was, you know, the connection that I was making rather than, you know, we can do a bit of recycling and hope to solve the world's problems. Um, I mean, in terms of the sort of, you know, is, how can we make this, the solutions an exciting and um, space? Uh, you know, this is, a, as you yourself have said, a massive challenge, an absolutely unprecedented challenge in the whole of human history. Um, and, and my sense is that, you know, despite the sort of slow progress on the political level, actually we are reaching that tipping point where we're recognising that actually we're going to have to try and figure out how the hell to meet this challenge. Um, and actually that then open, does open up the possibility for really exciting, creative and innovative solutions that are not going to come from the traditional places that we've seen from in the past. And you know, I'm often working with people in you know, all sorts of developing countries who've got amazing different ideas of how to do things. And I think tapping into some of those and, and some of that creative and innovative spirit could be quite interesting and exciting and different and new. Can you give us an example of something, like a story where you think that will really capture people's imagination? I mean, certainly some of the, um, I mean, Joe might be able to think of some other examples, but I, I mean, I think especially in the, in the developing world, in Africa, some of the things that are going on in terms of um, developments um, that at a local level in terms of um, the use of solar power and solar powered lighting and then integrating that into a whole kind of um, uh, sort of micro economy model and so forth. There's lots of kind of interesting case studies you could go and look at in a documentary way, I would have thought, of that nature. And then what's interesting about that, as we saw with the um, mobile phones and banking um, initiative. I mean, that was sort of driven partly by funding from Vodafone, so it wasn't a completely locally generated solution, but it definitely developed first in Africa and now is coming to us um, in the UK. So there's, you know, there are different, and I tell you another thing that's interesting is that this, um, I mean, I've talked a bit about the business world. A lot of the solutions involve really creative partnerships of a very unlikely nature between NGOs and businesses and government support and it's just a different way of doing that responding to this challenge the solutions are, are just different to the solutions that we've had in the past and that's what makes it interesting and it's tapping in and finding out what those are that I think is where the interesting stories are. It, it may be a problem to get locked into a kind of problem solution dialectic because this is incredibly knotty um, but but uh, the only time I've cried at work uh, well cried at work in a good way um, is at the Ashton Awards and so this is just a plug to everyone to go and look at the Ashton Awards every year they award a body of prizes to developing world and UK uh, energy and uh, energy efficiency stories and uh, they're incredibly powerful ranging from how the National Trust saves 
uh, tens of million pa millions of pounds a year with a great return on investment through to people that are able to uh, cook in their um, in their very small homes uh, safely for the first time in their lives, massively increasing life chances, uh, s uh, health, uh, and so on um, in uh, African context. So there, you know, there's a great big wadge of a 10-year archive, David, that uh, you would mine for uh, stories that are, I think, you know, immensely human stories, um, but also respect the scale of the jeopardy somehow. Um, I don't mean, and I apologise if that has come across, I don't mean to uh, underestimate the scale of the risks that we face. Um, they are, I think it's true to say, unparalleled. unparalleled. Yeah. Okay, let's have some more comments and questions. Uh, yeah. yeah, any more? Yeah, over here. Yeah, David Walker again. A uh, couple of points. First of all, um, demonization of the oil companies. I think we have to face up to the fact that we're in a battle here, a battle with six of the biggest companies on the global stock market who make millions of dollars, who think it's just fine to make billions of dollars of profit every year from extracting fossil fuels, and those of us who feel that 80% of their assets need to stay in their ground. And that is a battle, and it's a battle which I think we're really unlikely to win because they have so many resources at their disposal. And the second thing is, yes, it's absolutely true, as George Marshall says in his book, don't even think about it, that most of the planet knows that climate change is a problem. But when you come to ask them, what are the major issues that you need to talk about? They talk about good governance, they talk about food, they talk about education. And if you look at the UN survey of 7 million people, My World 2015, action on climate change comes at the very bottom of the list. Only a fifth of the respondents actually mention it at all. So although we know it's a problem, there's something in our neurological makeup that makes us not even want to think about it. And I think it's interesting, yes, that when there are good programs of it, young, young people flock to them because obviously it's more their challenge than ours. But I think the other thing that is a huge problem is the failure of international leadership. We've been watching the UN cock up this issue since 2002, in Copenhagen, in Rio, and probably again this year in Paris. G20 passed a resolution to stop uh, subsidies for the um, fossil fuel industry, which we thought were then about a trillion dollars a year, and the IMF now tells us it's $5.3 trillion. A lot of that is developing countries who want to keep the price of oil low so that their farmers can get their goods to market. So that's why it didn't pass in Rio Plus 20 and hasn't passed the General Assembly. Where is that international leadership coming from? I would hope it would come from the media, and it's not at the moment. Okay, over here, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, hi, my, my name's Justin Jones from Small World Productions. Uh, I've been covering environment issues for about 30 years, and what I've found in the, is that the environment falls between the two stools. On the one hand, you have development, on the other, you have animal welfare. And the animal welfare and the animal issue has been covered by natural history. And the development has been covered by poverty and, and campaigns to reduce poverty. But media has failed categorically to engage with the middle one in terms of our environment and particularly in terms of climate change because it can't get a handle on it. It can't get, see the character in it. It, can't see, it can see the character in development and poverty and it can see the character in fluffy polar bears. But it can't see where, how to get hold of climate change. And I think it's also stuck in the past of this is it really happening or is it not really happening debate, which it has to get out of. It has to get out of that. It has to engage in climate change if it is going to meet its responsibility to be a catalyst for change. So the other, the one of the things I'd like to say is that one way that the uh, media can grapple with climate change is through a very uh, popular media uh, subject, which is food. Okay, over here and then behind Justin. Yeah. I've already got a mic. So okay, I'll, yeah. <laughs> just a quick comment um, rather than a question. Um, I'd just like to recommend an organisation called Common Cause to anyone who hasn't heard of it. Uh, they do quite a lot of research on both framing and how people react to what they call bigger than self problems, so including quite a lot of stuff about climate change and conservation issues as well. And what I found interesting about the stuff they've found is that although there's often an assumption that 
issues that seem worthy or involving kind of collective action are a turn off to people, um, very often they can actually, they have the opposite effect. People are very pleased to see those kinds of issues being worked on. And so that kind of goes to show that finding positive solutions of collective action and telling more stories about collective action as a solution to climate change could potentially get a much better response than perhaps um, you know, t TV slots think it might. But, but I think the reaction you've already heard from the commissioners is that television isn't good at that kind of coverage. Are you, are you disagreeing with that? Um, I suppose the second point would be maybe to, to change the imagery because um, maybe it would be great in the next couple of years to see a climate change programme without a single uh, carbon glacier or a single polar bear because that's, that's very boring now. And, um, and maybe even without a single statistic and just, just purely focus on human stories kind of get right to the end point of that. <laughs> okay. Um, I think, let's hear from Zoe. She's made a lot of films. Just, just a sec. We've <laughs> got someone... Okay. Hold on. We've just got someone with a mic here. Can you wait, please? Hi. And then the lady here in the second row. She wants to directly respond. This is just to address uh, that, the comment from the chap in the, in the white jacket and also to ask a question for the panel. Um, one is we are... It's very simple for us because as human beings, we're hardwired to essentially deal with immediate threat, to negate and ignore the interconnectedness of geo and socio political effects and issues. So, governments, healthcare, and everything else all are tied and interlinked with climate change, although climate change is the bigger idea, whereas some of these things are much more immediate to us. Um, now, with businesses and also particularly with industry, Sometimes when they talk about sustainability, my question to them is always about whether or not they're just con concerned about the sustainability of their own profits. I would like to know from the panel what sustainability means to them. Okay, then there was a second row here. Oh, who's got the mic on Hi, this it's Zoe again from the science department at the BBC. <laughs> okay, um, can we the have the other mic here, please? One of the strands that I help look after is Horizon, and... Uh, firstly, the food idea is a really good one, and we started the run last year with a show called Should I Eat Meat for the Sake of the Planet, which was taking the climate change, I really hate the word debate, um, but looking at the food that we eat and the choices that we make in our own homes and how that affects the planet. And that show did really well, and very interestingly on Horizon, not only the overnights are good, but people should come to that show on iPlayer, and we get 30% uplift. People search out that information. There wasn't a glacier for a polar bear in sight. I'd say in the last, we do 15 shows a year, and in the last run, I'd say at least three of the shows have included climate change. We don't have to put it at its heart because the department made two shows on BBC Four, Horizon Guide to Climate Change, which was a brilliantly constructed show, in my view, went deep into the science, and absolutely, as I said earlier, outperformed its slot and outperformed the 16 to 34s. People will come to it. And on Horizon, we're putting climate change on your screen, month in, month out. It's a part of the DNA. Um, it may not have the glaciers, and maybe that's why, not, why people aren't recognizing it, but it's absolutely out there. So I challenge the idea that we're not covering climate change because, well, I am. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, I'm glad you mentioned should I eat meat. I think that's a very good example of reframing climate change. It's a program that has a subject, meat is the ostensible subject, what we eat, but underscoring that is a discussion about su sustainable food production. But Zoe, since you have the mic, um, all right, can she? <laughs> uh, let, let's just try and move things forward a bit. I think we've got a clear idea from the panel who are saying to us, we have to think about what are the strengths of television? Television is good at some things and not other things. Let's just try and tease out to help producers who are pitching ideas to you. What, in terms of climate change, what is television good at? I mean, I think food and meat, that's a good example. Uh, and what is television bad at? And let's just try and take that forward. That's such a big question, I'm not sure I have the answer to that. And if I did, I'd probably be sitting in Cassian's seat. 
That's me. Well, well, I, well, I tell you what I would say. So Horizon does a really broad range are you, of subjects. You're an exec producer. Series in, producer on Horizon. On Horizon. Okay. Um, so I'm in charge of look after the development. And it's a huge, broad range of subjects. And I will tell you this, on almost everything, because climate change affects our lives in almost every single area, I could get climate change in every single show. You can touch on it everywhere. So to sit there and say that you actually, do you have to confront it head on? No, I agree with what you were Joe saying, that you can put it in Blue Peter, you can put it in the arches, you can put it in how you design houses. It doesn't have to be, um, it can be big and it can be small and it can be and should be. And I would argue in some senses is everywhere, or certainly on the horizon. So you wouldn't agree that television could do better from where you sit television's doing pretty no well can do better don't be silly yeah. well how could you do better oh. i don't know maybe you guys can tell me <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just nice to hear from the audience for a change uh, we've got one more question here can any does anyone else want to talk about this idea of what television is good at so that we can tease that out a bit yeah yeah, I'll cover that in a slightly rambling question slash provocation if I can, which is that I, when I was 21, I realised for the first time that a chicken in the supermarket was actually the wrong way up uh, because I had such an abstracted relationship to the food on my plate. And I've gone vegetarian in January and finding it very difficult. Uh, and when I say to my friends... So you obviously watch The Horizon. No, I haven't, I haven't actually seen it. I will, I will now check it out. But it, it's difficult to be a vegetarian, uh, apart from the fact that when you sit down to a meal, everyone immediately challenges you on the implied criticism of their own eating habits, which is a, which is a really difficult situation. And the common answer is, oh, well, I just couldn't give up meat. I love it too much. I like the taste too much. And it's about this idea of abstraction, the, 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 the relationship between humans and animals being so far removed now, and the same is applicable to the idea of climate change for the reasons that have been mentioned about it. It's, it's essentially an abstract idea. And my provocation would be, is factual television the best arena to be dealing with these abstract notions, or is it not in fact the broader arts, literature, fiction, allegory, and metaphor that are really gonna position us in a, in a better position to kind of engage with these ideas? Because I, I would love to watch the mathematicians take on climate change and going behind the numbers, but I wonder where it leaves us at the end of the programme in terms of converting the idea of engaging with facts through to activism and engagement. So that's my provocation. But what, what would fiction about climate change look like? I mean, the BBC a few years ago did a drama which really wasn't very good. Ian McEwan's written a book which isn't very good. Which I mean, suggests that other people couldn't do it better. Just because that was bad, it doesn't mean... There's a fantastic one called Take Shelter, I don't know if you've seen that, which is essentially an extended kind of allegory. I'm just, I'm simply proposing that facts aren't really helping. If people are polling, as the gentleman in the white jacket said, climate change as the lowest, even though they're informed, it's coming down as the lowest of their concerns, then it seems we need more than facts in order to provoke engagement. So that's, that's it's, just, it's just a provocation okay, that I'm so, interested to hear. Yeah, we've had a few questions about climate change falling between two stools, a failure of media leadership, um, BBC Science doing a good job, and cross-genre, should we think about fiction or drama? So, um, Cassian, you, you did make the point there are some things that television are good at. Can you... Take that forward a bit. Bounce back. Um, sure. Um, I think that um, uh, uh, it's it's you know, obviously television's good at an awful lot of things, but nevertheless, I think there are some 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 things that I always uh, hold on to, particularly when looking at these things. In, and it goes back to some of the programmes that we've talked about, which is when you're we've talked a lot about the abstraction of climate change. I think that's a really big challenge with it, which is that they are big abstract words which are things that don't directly and physically and tangibly relate to people's lives. I think when you can find the ways and the tools and the things which are tangible is the word uh, through which you can tell stories then that becomes incredibly helpful. So when it is about meat that's really helpful. It's a thing that people understand which they engage with on their daily life. There's actually Although it's more abstracted, there was still that trick being shown in the BBC4 in the climate change by numbers, which is three numbers. There are three things that we are going to unpack. 
Um, and that sense of actually television does tend to work strangely by virtue of taking the very small and expanding out behind it rather than just going in on the very big and then trying to keep on engaging the people through it. So that's one thing that I'd say. I think the other thing, which is a really interesting one, which goes back to the discussion about um, positives and good news stories, um, is that I absolutely agree, the projects that you're describing sound brilliant and they sound absolutely fantastic. I think the real challenge is that what those don't do is those don't translate easily into hours of television that are engaging stories. They're brilliant projects but not brilliant television stories. Um, and that, I think, goes to what David says, which is actually what he's looking for is more fibre and more meat in the tale that he wants to tell, and I'd have real sympathy there. So actually, you need higher levels of jeopardy, complexity, all the rest of it, and again, things that people can engage with to really make a television story work. But I think the other thing that we are, which we haven't really talked about in this context, which is an, another bit of the BBC, uh, but which is still important, and it goes to those stories that you're telling, is that... We shouldn't discount the fact that actually, again, climate change in its narrative is an incredibly important part of what is becoming the news and current affairs narrative. There's 15 minutes on climate change and on the G7 on the Today programme this morning. Those projects, those brilliant ideas that people are doing and are coming up with are absolutely part and parcel of what we do again in terms of news and current affairs coverage. So there is that space there. It's about finding the right place for the right kind of story. And those kind of good news stories, those brilliant new ideas do have their places. They tend to form more within the news context, though. Does that help? Um, could, you, could you do something, you know, a sort of yeah, an sure. apprentice-style thing for creative solutions? I mean, there's the people at British Antarctic Survey who are looking at um, marine organisms um, in the oceans off Antarctica are incredibly well adapted to the cold temperatures and therefore very good at producing materials in a you know, very low energy way. And, and places, people like, like Land Rover Jaguar are interested in mm -hmm. whether they can try and take some of that, um, you know, bio um, technology and, uh, and, and use it in their world. It, it, there's all sorts of kind of ways in which people are kind of creatively trying to look for new innovation in this Absolutely, kind of space. Yeah, I think. Is this, could you do something sort of, you know, Apprentice style that you could apart from a, yeah, I, I, I think it sounds brilliant as a kind of thought, as a thought and a model to work with. Your challenge is that your apprentice or your or your dragon's den or yeah, whichever so it is are the reason why people come to them is because the things that are being talked about and the things that are being offered is stuff that they can see in their daily lives. It's that tangibility which connects the audience. It's about finding the thing, finding the the mechanisms, the objects, the issues that actually people feel out. Oh, actually, that's something that genuinely matters to me. And I think that's the danger. I'm not saying it's not a good idea, but that's the danger of thinking about, oh God, that's a brilliant idea for analysing marine organisms in the Arctic. Getting your audience to have the emotional investment in that is always going to be a little bit of an uphill yeah. struggle. That's all I'd say. Let, let's just hear from David. Let's just <coughs> tease out what television is good at. Um, well, I in suppose I would context. say that kind of, um, just listening to everything that people have said, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm in no position to criticise the BBC's output, and I think it's good that they're doing all that stuff. And I wouldn't be lazy in my assumption saying that people won't watch it. I think that there might be a shift in mood that people will come to this subject matter. Um, but the truth is, we're not doing that great. Uh, I mean, in the sense that a recent survey said that of all the countries on Earth, Britain is second only to America in lack of engagement in this at the moment. So, I mean, you know, the idea that somehow we're doing so much and it's all going swimmingly, the truth is people don't really engage with it in this country. That's, that, that's in the science press today. Um, so I think that um, how, do we, how do we get people to engage with it? I think that's something very interesting. I think that Cassian's right to talk about being, things being tangible. Um, I, think, I, I'm thought, I think there's a filmmaker in the 80s called Michael Barnes who made some genius horizons including one about um, San Francisco and the threat of an earthquake. And it's very hard to make a film about a threat of an earthquake that hasn't happened. And yet he made an extraordinary film where he kind of got into the granular details of it. He got into the details about how the actual land on the, on the fault was much cheaper than other land. And so the government built, bought that land and built schools on that land. So actually kids' playgrounds were actually built on the actual bit, which is most likely to crack open and fall into the ground. And then he took a white picket fence of one of these schools, which had actually snapped and broken on the edge of the school. And you could actually just see that, oh my God, this, you know, this school's built on this kind of unbelievably dangerous foundations. And it's very tangible. And I find it quite hard to get that out of climate change, but I have got it a couple of times, weirdly, talking randomly to gardeners 
<laughs> and um, there's this gardener, I was saying, do you, do you get influenced by climate change? He goes, yeah, of course. The whole, the, 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 the plants that we plant are just a different set of plants that work in this country from 20 years ago. I thought, that's, God, that's interesting. And then another one said to me, um, that the seasons are just, they have different lengths now, the seasons in this country, in terms of a gardener's perspective on it. And that you, kind of, you can carry on, I don't know, I don't know anything about gardening, but uh, you can carry on into kind of November doing whatever it is. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, 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 the autumn or whatever stretches into, you know, and it's basically, and I suppose what I'm trying to say is, I think that suddenly that feels tangible. And I think that, I think there are ways of connecting if we're clever enough. And I think that what, what Cassian's saying is right that if you make it tangible in those kinds of ways, you've got to hope. I suppose what I'm saying to you guys is that the truth is that TV is a bit, it's trickier than just saying we could make an apprentice or a dragon's den with it, even though I admire what you're saying and trying to do. But TV, like with business, for example, someone once said to me, business programs are only good when the business is going wrong. <laughs> you know, a business going well is boring. It's all just swimming me. A business on the verge of bankruptcy, fantastic. You know, the same way we love, you know, the TV loves Nazis and sharks. Do you know what I mean? There's a kind of way in which the bad stuff is more dramatic, more intense, and telling good stories of how a new piece of design something is being successful is much harder. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, we don't just, plenty just of negatives. Well, no, I know, I know, but I suppose what I'm getting from you guys, which is interesting, is it's almost like we tried the shock negative and the world went, oh, don't fancy that. And you're now saying, let's reframe it to make it a kind of a, a gentler, sweeter, better, good news story, which sounds good, but I do think it's hard for TV. That's the truth of it. I don't think people would come to a program like that. And so answering Mark's question, TV wouldn't be good at a, a climate special apprentice. That wouldn't be a good TV program, probably. Okay, we'll have a few more comments, questions from the audience. No, it, it wasn't really, I was just interacting. You were saying that if you want to make a, a, a bad news report on it, you have a lot of opportunities with climate change. So that's, okay. that's the only comment. Uh, anyone else on this? Yeah, over there and here. Yeah. You go first. No, yeah, um, no, you go first. Uh, I just wanted to talk just about... Just say who you are, uh, please. Uh, Archie Barron. I just wanted to talk about diversity for a moment, because I think there may be an analogy here. For many, many years, people have been anxious about representations of the nation on television, and it's been an issue that, that uh, people have expressed a lot of concern about. And, you know, recently, in their different ways, the broadcasters, in a very, very vigorous and active way, have um, effectively legislated for it. They legislated it for it on screen and off screen in different ways, and it seems to be reframed. Uh, and it's reframed because, you know, 15% of Britain uh, uh, is BAME, or um, and so diversity is part of what we do. And you know, 4% of them, the electorate voted green. A vast number of people who didn't vote green are very concerned about climate change. A large number of people um, are going to live to 2050 or the end of the century. Short-termism politically is um, uh, much easier in terms of how you cast your vote than thinking long-term. And what TV is good at, or what broadcasters are good at, is scale, ambition, taking something seriously, and then going for it. And they're certainly going for it when it comes to diversity in a way that makes us all recontextualize and reframe the issue. So I don't think it's satisfactory to just say, um, you know, it's difficult. I think that the broadcasters separately and collectively could have the muscle to say, this is our audience. The, these are issues that affect them all. They do care about it. Young people are going to be living with all of this kind of stuff and sort of think about long term. And I think that, I think that the way that um, diversity um, has been addressed is a way that, you know, uh, uh, thinking about the environment could. And I don't, you know, people were knocking Sky's recycling policy uh, um, uh, uh, um, because Celia was talking about how that you know there isn't a rubbish bin at, at Sky HQ. Uh, but some of that does begin at home, and there is a degree to which you know the way we operate and, and work as companies and in the industry is also important. But I do think that um, uh, it's actually about priorities, and the broadcasters probably could bring the collective imagination and effort of everyone together to think about this in the same way they did with diversity. Um, Archie, I'm glad you think that, um, uh, uh, that diversity is good, although I'd say that personally I think our performance on diversity is almost as bad as our performance on climate change. I don't think that, you know. Yeah. Mm. 
But your, your point is really repeating the point about media leadership. Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um, uh, You're saying, in effect, there's an absence of leadership. Are you pitching ideas on climate change and um, facing a wall of uh, resistance? Um, it's one of those things where my heart tells me we should really develop strong climate change ideas, and we've had meetings, and we've talked about it, and we talk with the teams and try and get them together, and we, we barely even get to the pitch stage because we think it's not going to get past... Uh, it's, we're not, you know, we're waiting for the big idea to take to David, but that big idea is probably how to how to save the world, and that's hard to do in order to make a television program about it. Um, uh, it's really, really hard to come up with those kind of really big ideas for David. And you know, Cassian's doing his bit. Russell's idea sounds great. I'm not sure that for BBC Four, it should be our priority to develop uh, ideas around climate change for BBC Four when he can't even commission the good ones that have already been offered to him. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, you know, so, so, so we actually, as in our company, we spend too long uh, talking about climate change. I, I, was get, I had a choice for this session. Should I go to the climate change one or the alternative funding platform <laughs> session, which is happening at the same time? And that's the one I should have been in, you know, in, in terms of running a company, because that's all the pots of money I don't know about that might give you know, my business other avenues. But I came here because I'm sort of still trying to find David's big idea, but I'm not any, um, any close to it. Can, can I just take up that point you said about diversity and the parallels with diversity? Because I think it's an interesting point, and I think that um, it's a good point. Um, I suppose I think the diversity, they're coming at it from two ways in a way. One which is sort of like putting in sort of tick box systems, which are actually probably necessary to make change. And we could do that. But I suppose the most interesting thing I've heard about diversity actually was said by Danny Cohen at an event when he was taking over BBC One. And he was, it wasn't about diversity, he was talking about regionality. And he was sort of, someone was saying, BBC One's output, there's not nearly enough from the regions. You should do more from the regions. And he said, you know, this isn't a problem, this is an advantage. With the drama shows in America, you can tell where they're coming from. You, you know, Cheers is from Boston, NYPD Blues New York, you know, Fraser's Seattle. And because of that regionality, they get extra flavor in the programs. It's actually an advantage. And I suppose I think the same about diversity, that, you know, kind of, um, that actually having diverse people on the screen makes them more interesting. You're getting fresher, more interesting opinions. You know, do this goggle box, amazing variety of people in the program. It's not diversity for a tick box sake. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is I think that rather than sort of, sort of giving the viewer, like, take your medicine because you're forced to, I think we've got to look deep into the actual thing and see kind of see it and try and turn the problem into an advantage in that scale way. Now, I know it sounds crazy talking about big stuff to save the world, but I think I'm sure that the solutions will be in the thing itself, not that, rather than pretending that it's okay, you know, that, you know, sugaring the pill, I think. But I may be wrong. Maybe both strategies, if you try both, you know. Okay, we have a few more yeah. minutes. Any? Hello? Who, who's got the I mic? have a mic. All right, you go, and then there's a lady behind you. Thanks. I, I feel the urge to stand up and... and Say who you are. Is Christian Vassi. Um, I have the strange background of being a film composer and a filmmaker and having been a politician. It really isn't about making things gentler. Uh, David, you posed the question at the start, are human beings capable of setting aside self-interest? I would say it's about reframing what self-interest is. In this country, we waste billions of pounds of energy every year because we don't have uh, district heating in our power stations. That causes fuel poverty. That is causing misery on, on a huge scale and huge problems. Surely the challenge is how do we enable citizens across the country to engage with those issues and to see how they can be a part of the solution and how they can put pressure on politicians to create a solution is not a gentle thing. It's about shifting and reframing concepts of self-interest and being more internationalist and looking to best practice in the rest of Europe, for example. Just being less parochial and, and more interested in the international perspective. Okay, there was someone here. Yeah. Hi, my name's Rimba. Um, I'm a former neuroscientist and, and now a farmer. Um, there, there, there's a generation of, of younger people whose perspectives we haven't really picked up on. And I think um, I know a lot of people that, that they work in their day jobs 
which might be at the BBC or Channel 4 or wherever, but a lot of the rest of the time they're doing things like working with food banks, they're doing urban farming, they're doing all kinds of incredible things. There's a generation that we're not tapping into, and, and it's that edge, really, that we need to kind of find, because it's not going to happen in the mainstream. So the guy talked about diversity. You know, let, let's look at the margins, um, and, and, and that's the way it will make its way into the, to the mainstream, because we need to change not just the, the language and the way in which you talk about this, but to create that kind of distress, because at the end of the day, people here, we're, we're too middle-class, privileged, and comfortable to make the changes that we need to make. So, you know, imagine if we opened up a, a window into the equator and looked at people who are living there right now, who are living with the real effects of climate change. You know, you did a, you, you did a soap proper and you put that into EastEnders. Um, you did Gogglebox and you turned, you looked at that. We sent Stacey Dooley, BBC Three, you know, we YouTube challenge stuff. The young generations, they're not watching television, excuse me, um, at the moment. They're, they're on other platforms. And, you know, they're, they're in closed platforms. They're trying to close us out of their world because we've spoilt it. Okay. Uh, so so th th there are our options. Don't feel like we've got to come to the one big solution. There's lots of different things that we could try. And I, and I dare you to, to be bold and to be brave and try many things. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're, thank you. We ha what we'll do is we'll have a few final questions. Then I'll come back to all the panelists to respond. Yeah, um, over there. Uh, I'm, I'm Felicity Mahendley and I'm a surgeon and a scientist and I wanted to follow on from the point about climate change being so low down on people's priorities. And I think it's just because there's other more mundane things people worry about, other things that maybe are more pressing where their actions and the consequences are much more in their face not remote, i.e. remote in the future, or remote because they happen to other people. And we sort of wrapped up in our own world without perspective. And what would be great would be to have programs that change perspective. So maybe slightly tongue in cheek, but something that takes the public in Britain and plants them in countries that are at risk of the impact of climate change and lives three weeks with them, looking at their daily lives and transplant someone back to us in Britain and actually look critically at what we do that impacts on families. And, and it sort of crosses into maybe entertainment, but maybe reaches an audience that wouldn't come to a pure science program. Okay, and there was someone on this side. Any more? Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Ash Robinson. Um, short form content creator. Um, I'm wondering if, um, I mean it's a bit of blue sky thinking, but what if uh, there was some kind of um, public statement of encouragement from broadcasters, even if it was cross-channel, cross kind of consensus that said X percent of our broadcasting is going to touch on climate change and, and that can be then worked into other ideas and things like that. If, if, if that happened, perhaps content creators would be encouraged to really put in the time and energy investment into coming up with, with, with ways to reframe this debate and really present it to, to the public in, in innovative and fun, engaging ways, which the investment in doing that is quite hard. When we hear discouraging stories of people that have had ideas for a long time and trying to get them on screen, it's, it's perhaps, you know, we've got to pay the mortgage as well, so we come up with, we do other things instead. So maybe it's um, something that could come from, from broadcasters in general, maybe even a consensus. Okay, and then someone behind, one person on this side. No? Okay, last. Just for those people who are here because they want to get programmes about climate change on telly, what do you expect the result to be? So if you succeed and you develop something great and it gets commissioned, three million people you know, have a nice time, a nice hour on their sofa watching it, it gets on Gogglebox, you know, and, and what then? On Sunday in this room there were two really good sessions on creating impact and making change. Um, and I think the question is, what is the desired change? What do you want to happen after that? Are your efforts really best focused on television to achieve the change that you want? Okay, good question. So um, if I can just pick up some of those questions. We've, it's been suggested we, that we should look more at people in other parts of the world who are directly impacted uh, again, a call for more le media leadership. Um, how can you encourage producers who feel quite discouraged? And the final point about what, what is the impact that television can have? 
So can we, we start with you, just uh, yeah, sure. Cassie. Um, uh, I'm taking them, taking them slightly in reverse order, I might go. Uh, uh, your point about what is the impact that television can have, I think, is a really salient one and goes back to what I was saying earlier, which is about considering what it is, you know. So obviously a lot of people in this room who are very engaged with this subject are thinking absolutely what is it that you want to achieve. Um, you mentioned, you know, uh, making a program that gets three million people, but then what's happening? Frankly, if you can come up with a climate change program that is climate change on the nose and gets three million, I'm happy. You can do what you want after that. That's where the challenge lies. But it, it is genuinely think about what it is that that you want from television and what you want it to do, because in the end, you know, we are broadcasters. We make television. We have a remit. Um, we really want to do good things and to engage the audience and do brilliant things. I'm not sure that we can stand up and say, right, we want to become the front line of the climate change debate and the climate change argument. I don't know that that's a broadcaster's job particularly. We're really, you know, we know, David and I are very passionate about the subject and we know it's salience, but as, a camp as the figurehead of a campaigning organisation, we're probably not the place to go to. We could put it on the agenda, but that's what we can do. Um, I think the term, sorry, what are the other... Um, featuring stories from other parts of the world, people who are more uh, no, directly I impacted. I did actually develop and almost got away a climate change story, which was, um, here's, here's an idea, which if anyone can make it affordable, then bring it back to me, um, but I don't think it is, which was I did want to take a real British family and I was going to put them in one of those amazing geodes ge geodesic domes. I wanted to build a Victorian terrace house, put it in a geodesic dome, and then slowly turn up the temperature over the course of four months and get them to live and see what would happen to the house. So, you know, that, that, that's a kind of, you know, those are some, you know, that was a kind of living history experiment of the future of climate change. There are ways to think about it. So that goes to your idea of transplanting people. That's a lateral way of doing it. Um, but I think that's the thing which often happens with ideas and ways of doing things with scale is unhappily we are always mitigated by affordability too. Um, I think the, 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 the final point, though, which goes to the thing of quotas, as it were, and the idea of doing a quota, is that um, I don't think that's right, because there are, if we do a quota for that, then there are a million things, and there are, there, there are countless things that, as broadcasters and running BBC4, and even the BBC4, the BBC is a, as an organisation wants to, needs to, has to do. Um, and and, and those are, those, the, the, there are many of them that are competing priorities but nevertheless remain really important. I think the challenge does remain, and it's, it's, it's a shame perhaps we haven't got to the absolute solutions here, the challenge does remain that television remains difficult. It's hard to find those perfect ideas that engage hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. I think we've given some thoughts about what are the best avenues towards that. But as much as you know, Archie's comment about diversity and all the rest of it, as I was saying, that's a real challenge. That's a really difficult thing to do. So unhappily, I would say there are no quick fixes, but the door is always open if you think you have that killer, tangible idea that we could talk about. Joe? Uh, I think we need the... We've got two public service broadcasters with us today. I think we need their um, impartiality far more than we need their campaigning, their untested campaigning gifts. Um, I also think we need their creativity and capacity to tell stories. And in that respect, I'll go back to the nice point made earlier about the power of stories beyond purely factual media. And a project we're working on is working with the Advanced Manufacturing Centre here in uh, Sheffield, uh, one of the biggest of its type in Europe. But we're also working with the oldest factory in the world uh, just further down the Derwent Valley. In both of those sites, people totally get the idea that climate change is one of the most important but also exhilarating challenges that they professionally face as decision makers. There are stories there. We are incidentally working with an insane mix of poets, uh, uh, puppeteers, uh, animators and so on to try and tell those stories in a fresh and innovative way. If we can do it as academics, for goodness sake, honestly. Um, <laughs> Just a couple of more points, if I may. Just quickly, really please. Quick. Uh, we're trying to transform the political economy of energy in a short space of time. There will be goodies and baddies. Um, I, we need factual media to help us with that. Um, but a last thought that is drawn from the building we're in, 1891. You might think this building was built for the glorification of the um, overweight burgers of Sheffield at the time. Um, I think it's best to read it as a, a kind of temple to toilets because in the second half of the 19th century, this city 
understood that it had no competitive global future unless it sorted out clean drinking water in some way for people to shit. And their achievement of that across a few short decades was vital to the economy and well-being of their society. I think it's that kind of insight, uh, that kind of scale of thinking that's pertinent around climate change. And I just think we should work harder to unpick that story at that scale. Emily? Um, so, I mean, my, my take home from, from what uh, um, the broadcasters are looking for is something that is relevant to people's lives and tangible. Um, but it seems to me that, therefore, maybe where a significant focus of efforts is not, should not be so much how can we find the climate change story to make a television program about, but instead to take much more of the horizon lead. Climate change does permeate every aspect of our lives, and so instead maybe it's a case of taking whatever topic um, one wants to make a documentary about and challenging that, that question, that topic. You know, we've heard the example of meat, um, and saying with that topic, you know, what are the risks posed to that topic by climate change and, and where are the opportunities that that topic then lends itself to? And, you know, Joe's raised examples of where the arts has sort of responded yeah. to that okay. kind of challenge. So rather than doing a climate change thing, instead taking the topics as they are that are more relevant to people's everyday lives and looking at where climate change enters into those topics. Okay, David. I mean... I think we probably need an all of the above strategy. And I basically, I don't want to sound too negative about the things you guys are talking about because I'm sure people will be clever enough to, to do that. Um, I think that, uh, what do I think? I think that basically, to answer all the different questions, the other parts of the world documentary idea that you suggested, I think that's tricky because I think that actually TV, the actuality of one family going to live in, in some part of Africa to meet the other family, I think the footage you'll get will be about human stuff like, in a kind of anthropological way. I don't think it will be about climate change in the way you hope it will be, and not naturally. And I think you'd have to sort of shoehorn that in, probably. It's just, that's my instinct for it, but you know, I may be wrong. But I just think there's a kind of way in which it's not as simple as that, I would say. Um, in terms of um, the media leadership point, I'd say that um, I don't want you to feel discouraged. Um, I think that kind of, the, you know, I hope you're hearing from us that we really would like to be involved in this. Um, I, I know I would be, and basically, you know, the door is open massively for these ideas. But I kind of, the project where I work at Channel 4, it's this, as I was trying to say earlier, it's a combination of kind of uh, trying to be commercial, getting, we don't get any license fee, we get, you know, we need to fight against the X Factor or whatever it is on the other channels. But we also want to be public service. Now, this is clearly public service, but I, I won't commission something just out of part of a quota. It's not the project I'm involved in. I don't really want to either. I want to find the perfect thing that has both. Um, and in terms of the good point at the end about um, is it what do you expect to achieve? I suppose I'm worried that you guys are going to go away thinking that somehow TV, we've kind of given up as a medium on TV, that somehow, you know, kind of it's very tricky for TV. Sorry about this, you know, sort it out on the internet. Um, I'm not, that's not what I feel. And I kind of feel that in terms of what's a tangible thing, I think public opinion, it's a, it's a, it's a circle, isn't it, of politics and public opinion and the media are in the middle of that. And we've got to be part of that circle moving around. And I think if you can get that, change can happen very quickly. And actually, sort of, there are loads of things in the history which have looked intractable, and then suddenly the human race has got, you know, the, the abolition of slavery or the drop the debt stuff I was talking about earlier or, you know, kind of the end of apartheid. There are things that happen which can happen very quickly and it just needs the right oomph. And I also don't want to sound negative about... Um, how people, much people are interested in this stuff, because I think documentaries can be incredibly box office even when they're doing serious things. So I think of things like Michael Moore, um, Bowling for Columbine or whatever, which took something like $100 million at the box office, biggest documentary, one of the biggest ever, along with Fahrenheit 9-11. He started small on Channel 4. Um, and I think that kind of, you know, there is a possibility to start small with this and find the right leader or face of it or the person that can unlock it. And that could really, really change the world. I, th I, I certainly believe it could. Um, so uh, that's kind of where I'm at. Thank you. Well, it's great to hear from the commissioners that the door is very much open. Thank you. You've been a great audience. If you want to hear five filmmakers pitch ideas about climate change, then join a, a, a different panel of commissioners at 4.30 in the chapel. But please join me now in thanking our panel today. Thank you.